Welcome to 15 Minute Fundamentals, where we break down crypto projects and learn about the drivers behind the data you see on our charts. Today, I'm joined by Nenad from DeFi Saber, a one-stop dashboard for managing your DeFi positions. Hi, Nenad. Welcome to 15 Minute Fundamentals. It's great to have yeah. you on. Hi, Oscar. Nice to meet you. Can I kick things off? Could you give us a quick intro to DeFi Saver? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, DeFi Saver is an advanced management dashboard. What that means is basically we integrate a bunch of different DeFi protocols. So everybody knows uh, protocols like Aave, Compound, Maker, Zero X, and so on, or Liquidity, Reflexor. Uh, with our app, you have it like all in one place, but it isn't just a kind of an easy way to access all that. We build on top of all these protocols, like advanced features that you can easily use to manage your positions in your portfolio a bit better. That's kind of the, the gist of it. If you're like an advanced DeFi user, our app is something that you'll probably be interested in. Got it. So everything you need in one app. Sounds good. Um, going a bit deeper into the core product, could you describe the main products and their features? I guess the best way to understand like DeFi Saver, like where the name comes up, is that uh, our first kind of use case was to save uh, maker CDPs from liquidation. One easy way to do that is you sell a bit of your collateral, repay the debt, and your your uh, ratio goes a bit up. So that that feature we call a repay. Obviously, that's kind of a slow deleverage. We have a reverse. If you want, if you're bullish and you want to leverage up, you can kind of boost your CDP. Um, that, that's something that we started off with, and it works great. We have it for Maker, for Aave, for all the all these different lending protocols. Uh, but one thing we noticed is that uh, users aren't like up all the time. Their uh, crashes happen. You know, crypto is active 24/7, and users cannot be active all the time. And liquidation bots are active all the time. So that that's a bit of an issue. So we created kind of a, a good bots. Um, we have our own system of bots that monitor your position, and each user can trustlessly set their own like settings. Like, hey, if if the price crashes, uh, repay a, a little bit of my CDP automatically for me. And that's something we are doing for the like past two, three years successfully and uh, stopped a lot of people from like getting totally wrecked and so on. So that's kind of the, the flagship feature is kind of automatic uh, protection of positions. We expanded that uh, a few months ago that it isn't just a repay or a boost action. We can uh, do a, like a complete uh, take profit or a stop loss at certain prices. Uh, users, that, that's one of our features as well. Uh, users can kind of passively stake stable coins to, to earn yield, like in protocols like mStable and so on. And we can uh, create like a strategy where if their CDP is going down, uh, we for from the, for them uh, we draw some uh, die from M stable and repay their debt. So we have a bunch of different we call them strategies, a bunch of different strategies to kind of automatically manage user positions the, the way they set it up. I could have definitely benefited by using that during the last crash myself, but hey, smarter for the next time. <laughs> I'd love to speak a bit about the recipe creator. I think it's an exciting feature. That's basically something that came about from like our architecture. Uh, we we noticed that we are building like custom contracts for each advanced feature we have. And obviously that isn't like too scalable and, and for security issues and so on. Uh, it, it wasn't like a, a good uh, technology approach. So we built a system of, we call them recipes, where we integrate uh, like smaller atomic actions like a supply to compound or withdraw from Aave. And from there we can build like a more complicated feature just by tying in all the, all the individual actions together. Uh, we wanted to make that accessible to the end user. So we created kind of a custom interface where they can easily drag and drop and create their own recipes. Uh, that came about that obviously like a lot of advanced users have their own like specific uh, use cases. Uh, DeFi is really big and everybody has like their own little way to trade and to do stuff. So that was kind of a way to allow us to enable the users to uh, basically create their own advanced features with, without us actually being, ha having to like code it exactly like that. Just with a drag and drop interface, they can kind of easily 
create something that is totally custom to them. Got it. And now that we're familiar with your products, could you describe your business model and how you at DeFi Saver are generating revenue? Yeah, definitely. So when we first started, we didn't have any like concrete business model in place. Uh, we noticed that users are obviously getting a lot of value from us uh, automatically doing stuff like repays and so on. Uh, so we added a 25 basis points on a trade, on advanced trade actions. Basically, what that means is if you do just like the basic actions you can do, you know, like other like in in Aave dashboard or something like that, we don't charge any fees on that. Like we don't charge any fees if you just exchange one token to another. But if you do a, let's say, an advanced action, like we have a loan shifter where you move your position from one protocol to another or you change your debt asset or something like that, if a trade occurs, uh, we take 25 basis points from the trade. And obviously, if we do like automatic actions for you, uh, we're going to take uh, like the transaction fees. They're going to come from like your CDP or your Aave position to, to pay back the transaction fees on Ethereum. Sure. Now, as you build these front ends for different uh, dApps like Compound, Aave or Liquidity, of which some have incentive models in place for front end operators, I was wondering whether these potential token incentives contribute towards your revenue in any way? Um, so basically, no. Uh, it kind of conflicts with the, the general idea when we started DeFi Saver, like how, how we thought about which protocols we want to integrate. As you know, there's, I guess, maybe not thousands, but there's a lot of DeFi protocols. And we often have discussions, okay, like which protocol, which, uh, that, like which app we want to integrate because we are almost like an aggregator of DeFi. So what stuff do we actually want in the app? And we, we are very picky about it. So we do want to kind of pick protocols that we believe that have like a good future, that aren't scams, that, that kind of uh, have something tangible behind them. So in, because we don't get any like money or incentives to integrate the different protocols, then we can pick just the stuff we actually use. So kind of the, the incentives there would be a bit weird if somebody could just pay us money and then we integrate them and then it, you know, it ends up not being a, a good protocol for the, the retail users. So it, it would kind of damage our brand. And so, so we, we try not, not to do that. Yeah, Makes sense. Um, a quick one, what chains are you currently live on? So recently we went live on Arbitrum and Optimism. Before that, we were exclusively on Ethereum mainnet. Uh, basically, I would say we, we have a background on being uh, Ethereum maxis, not, not the, the, the bad kind of maxis, but because we started really early on doing uh, development on the Ethereum chain and in the Ethereum ecosystem, we kind of have a strong belief that's kind of where the majority of the like right values of decentralization and transparency and so on like we currently we believe like the ethereum mainnet and some of the l2s i mentioned uh, are kind of the right way to DeFi right now uh, obviously there there's now a lot of different l1s and side chains and so on we are looking at those, but currently we are like strong believer that like Ethereum mainnet and then like really good L2 projects are going to like be the, the future. With launching on these new chains, have you seen any increases in usage or just in general changes in your current user behaviors? Uh, currently, I would say like not, not so much increased usage, but one of the really exciting part is that for a long time, our users were kind of priced out of using us because of the Ethereum mainnet fees. So we usually have like a more advanced transactions that do cost gas. With uh, L2s, we definitely see a lot of like smaller users that can play around with uh, different positions that can kind of do a lot more transactions and not get penalized by high fees. So that's something that's like really interesting that even though maybe the, the like the volumes are really low currently on L2s, but a lot of a lot of like smaller actions are happening, and that's something that's cool. Yeah. To recap on your revenue, you charge a twenty-five basis point fee on advanced trades, uh, of which all of these fees go to the protocol, as we can see on our revenue share chart. 
Another thing we see here is large spikes every now and then. Are these tied to moments of increased volatility or is there something else behind it too? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, like people often ask us, like, is it better if, like, for you guys if it's like a big crash or like a big uprising in price? It's always better when the price uh, jumps. Uh, people are way more bullish and, and price of Ether is high. Everybody's uh, really, really optimistic about, you know, everything. Uh, but we do actually earn like the revenue does spike when there's just a lot of volatility. So if the price crashes, obviously we save a lot of positions from liquidation. A lot of volume happens there. So we do earn a higher revenue. But, you know, we, we do like the the price pumps are much more uh, are much better for everyone and, and ourselves than the crashes. But obviously with us, we, we try to kind of limit the pain when the crash happens for the user yeah uh, what would you say are the biggest drivers or challenges related to current growth um the bear market <laughs> it's a good one no, yeah I'm, it's kind of true but we DeFi server actually started during the last bear market so it's it's a bit interesting to kind of see all the the hype kind of die down die down and you can kind of actually focus on on the product the, the biggest challenge, I guess, it's it's similar to most uh, DeFi uh, products. Like I said, uh, for a while, the, the high Ethereum gas prices, that's something that limited a lot of users because um, they basically needed to have a significant amount of money to, to actually kind of really use the product without worrying uh, too much about fees. So th that was one of the big one. And obviously, the like the standard uh, people not understanding uh, DeFi and like the onboarding new users who aren't really that uh, familiar with crypto and DeFi. That's always hard to kind of introduce them, especially because we're uh, a bit more an advanced uh, tool. So it's hard for them to kind of really navigate through. We have like a bunch of different features, so it's hard for them to kind of know how and when to, to use different stuff. So educating users how to actually properly utilize uh, our features it's, it's always a big challenge and who are the current users on your platform we see of the revenues coming in it's well the large cap stable coins eth etc but do you see it being retail dgen users or do you have a big whale user base yeah uh, i guess to, like to be quite honest it's a, a big whale user base okay. uh, one one thing like we are proud about uh, most of them when they started using us uh, weren't whales because we started during the last bear market a lot of users kind of grown up uh, with us like their portfolio as like eater rose and everybody was kind of i guess bullish eater on our app and eater went from like a hundred dollars to four thousand that kind of uh Made, made a lot of users into whales and obviously because uh, at a certain point like ethereum gas prices were high and so on they were kind of left over to, to use the app so i guess it i wouldn't just uh, distinguish them as whales Th those are usually like og users uh, they know a lot about DeFi. they use all the underlying DeFi protocols so kind of that's something that they have in similar in similarities that a lot of them are just kind of really knowledgeable users. They, they provide really good feedback, so, the, so that's awesome. So yeah, we are a bit more kind of towards the advanced side, but obviously even uh, novices can kind of go around and, and test stuff out. But in your words, what would you say is the biggest competitive advantage that DeFi Saver has compared to other aggregators or platforms that, that build frontends? Yeah, so because like DeFi is such a wide space and everything's happening, like we, we usually don't like, we don't like consider having like a direct competition because there's a lot of overlap with different applications, but then there's a lot of like synergy there we can, we can work together. Uh, I guess kind of the, the key feature that kind of distinguishes us from like uh, similar apps is like the, the strategies we have. So the like automatic actions we can take for the user. And that's something that's kind of working well for the past two years. And that's something that's pretty hard to to manage to work well. So yeah, that, that's kind of the, the, the core kind of feature for us is 
we can automatically do actions for the user and we don't have to, it's kind of a trustless system. They don't have to give us uh, their private keys and so on. It's kind of uh, utilizing the power of smart contracts and Ethereum. We can manage their positions at, at the times that are most needed. On governance, uh, I guess decision-making is currently done by the DeFi Saver team and you don't yet have a token out there, but do you have any plans for one? When token, uh, yeah. So basically, I guess we're one of the few protocols left that apps protocols, however you want to call us, left that don't have a token. Our reason behind that is we kind of we personally didn't see like a strong uh, reason and like a strong usage for the token, and we didn't want to release something just because we could. So we don't have any immediate plans for the token. If we do kind of find a, a right place for it. Why not? It's kind of one of the uh, good things about Ethereum that you can easily tokenize any project. You can easily kind of provide value there, but we don't have any like immediate plans for that. Yet. Outside of everything we already discussed, is there any upcoming major developments in your roadmap that you'd like to share? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, uh, like I said, we recently launched on L2s, but a lot of like uh, features aren't still up for L2s. Uh, one of the things we're working on is uh, providing like the automation system on, for Aave on L2s so you, you can automatically repay and boost on, on Optimism and Arbitrum. That's something that we're really, really excited about. And because we now build uh, the system with the recipes and strategies, we can easily add kind of more uh, complicated uh, strategies they can do like uh, DCA or they can do like stop losses and so on. So we really want to kind of expand the, the, all the different actions we can do automatically. We want to expand them and really have a user choose from like uh, a bunch of different strategies uh, to set up on our app. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nenad. This is great. Yeah, thank you.